Hello, everyone. I'm Allison Schill, the CEO and co-founder of Carrot. And today we're going to be talking about how to reduce waste, donate food and compost in commercial kitchens. Now that could be anywhere from a restaurant or a hotel, a hospital, or even a nonprofit kitchen. There are very similar things that happen in all different types of commercial kitchen situ situations that can be duplicated across the board when it comes to reducing food waste. Um, my history comes from a background of being a zero food waste expert, a zero waste expert across many different fields. And now I am primarily focusing on food donation, but I maintained a lot of the different information across the way about composting, which is another big passion of mine. And of course, food waste prevention, which is the most important thing we can do. So just to get started, a little bit of information about why we're doing this um, is that food waste is not only important for how much we're affecting the environment and, and hungry families, but just um, also the fact that restaurants have such a huge resource and opportunity when it comes to reducing the amount of waste that they have in, in the back of house. Um, and in the United States, it's as it says here, families spent about 51% of their entire budget at restaurants back in 2019. Now we know the world's gotten a little bit different since then, but uh, it's still true today that a lot of people spend money eating out. So today we're gonna go through steps to create a zero food waste kitchen by setting up a team and figuring out which part of this you wanna take on. If you wanna take on all of it, wonderful for you. If uh, you wanna just take on a part of it and uh, choose a project, we can do that for you as well. We're going to have a course uh, kind of a workbook that you can follow along with. And I'm gonna drop it in the chat here. We'll also show that course workbook on this demonstration as well. But I want you guys to be able to download that, take it back to your kitchens, and then also be able to utilize it um, to set up your own program. We're gonna talk about implementation and then we're gonna do a very brief carrot demo to show how to use carrot to donate food. All right, so waste is really a big deal in America. The average American throws away about a pound of food per person every single day. So if you added that up, that's almost the size of a small bowling ball worth of food every week that we're throwing away. Um, we spend a ton of money throwing away food. Actually, the amount of food that we throw away costs more than the total budget that the United States has on supplemental nutrition assistance programming, which is the uh, food stamps. And uh, anywhere from the farm level all the way down to the household level, we're throwing away um, between about 14 to 21% of all of the things we throw away are food. And when food goes into a landfill, it turns into the greenhouse gas called methane, which methane, if you don't know, is actually over 21 times more potent at damaging the it, as a greenhouse gas at trapping heat and trapping sunlight than carbon dioxide is. And food waste not only is bad for the air quality, but everything that goes into the production of food is also wasted along the way. <clears throat> now, I live in California, where most of the crops, such as salads and strawberries, a lot of different almonds, things like that are grown in California. And we have a huge drought that we're facing on a regular basis. It's rained a lot this year, but the drought is still there and uh, always threatening to take away water from crops. But at the same time, the amount of food that we throw away accounts for 20% of the entire water usage in California. So food waste is not just important for one reason. It's important for many reasons. But there's some good that can come out of donating food, reducing food waste, or composting it. Um, restaurants can save on their trash bill. Uh, fast food restaurants um, waste about 9% of the food that is purchased. 
and restaurants about 11%. And 53% of the trash that's in fast food restaurants is usually food. I mean, it's trash food, I get that. <laughs> but 95% of it is divertible, and that means that it could be recycled, donated, or composted. So the EPA created what is called the food recovery hierarchy. And what that means is what we should do with food should walk down a ladder of importance. The very first thing that we should do with food waste is reduce it. The best way to reduce it, um, we'll get through a couple of methods to do that in this course. Uh, but a lot of it is about planning, <laughs> about purchasing ahead of time, and about making different decisions with food that could be reused. The second most important thing to do is to feed hungry people because that reduces the amount of food that we have to grow to feed those people. The third is to feed animals. So a lot of times people might have a relationship with a local um, pig farmer or maybe they have some cows that can eat specific types of food that are generated on a, a retail basis. After that, they list industrial uses such as the waste oils from your, your deep fryer can be used for fuel conversion. And then we have composting. And finally, the last thing that we should ever possibly do with food waste is put it into the landfill. Uh, one of the course highlights is the 1996 Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act. A lot of people don't know that there are liability protections for any business that donates food in good faith, that that is a safe food to be donated will not have any repercussions if anybody gets sick. To date, there have been no legal repercussions for any food donors in the United States. There hasn't been nobody sued. A lot of people think that there have been. And we really need to spread this around so that more businesses know that you can donate food. You will not be held liable as long as you donate it uh, in good faith. And what in good faith means is following food safety protocol. So, Across the US, there are many different places, states, sometimes cities or uh, municipalities that are adopting policies that are targeting food waste. One of the biggest ones is in the state of California. Senate Bill 1383 has a statewide target right now to reduce the amount of organics that are going to the landfill by 75% in 2025. That includes composting, but they also have a rigorous mandatory food donation policy in place and other states are adopting these types of policies as well. State of Washington also has a food donation policy, state of New York. Um, there are several other cities and states that are kind of following in this these footsteps. This is the, the new trend. So any business that can get ahead of knowing how to compost food, how to donate their food, how to track it, are going to be 10 steps ahead of, of their municipality or their state in terms of following these guidelines. And you can save money by writing off uh, food donations on your taxes. Businesses can save up to 5,000 per year through food donations and tax deductions. All right, so step number one, food waste reduction. And what is reduction? It's stopping food waste from being created in the first place. So when you want to get started on looking through your own kitchen on places where you can reduce food, uh, this is where you are going to see things like um, maybe you're purchasing too much of a certain type of food. In the case of Ikea, they were able to reduce their food waste by 50% and they saved over 3 million meals and cut their costs of those meals just by doing a little bit of better purchasing, a little bit of understanding how much food that they were buying versus how much they were selling and forecasting. You're gonna save a lot of money that way. A restaurant could realize an additional $620 million in profits per year by adopting prevention solutions. Um, some of those are, um, we have a really great one called uh, Lean Path and uh, that's for smaller restaurants and then larger chains also can use um, Winnow which is another one of my favorites. Um, you can really save a lot of money uh, basically just by reducing the amount of food that you purchase. And I think a lot of restaurants that are small and lean are already pretty good at that. 
So to get started on a project with food waste reduction, first you wanna set your baseline. You have to get a team. It can't just be you alone doing this. You have to educate the other staff members and the owners about how to create a food waste reduction and a food waste prevention plan and buy-in about that. So you're gonna do some interviews, ask your team about waste, where they see it in their different stations, ask the bussers about what kinds of waste they're seeing on a regular basis. And you also need to get your hands on some inventory and some purchasing documents that will show you the costs and quantities of the different foods that you're wasting. You're gonna to wanna to keep a log for a week of the items that you're wasting. This will give you a really great insight into the types of foods that you can reduce, donate, or compost. So if you follow along in the workbook that was located in the chat here, um, you're able to kind of walk through the steps of creating a team, listing your team members, listing out the items that might go bad in the fridge each week, and do a trash can scan at each of your trash can stations, both in front and back of house. You can ask your chefs and busters which items are thrown away the most and keep a log of that. Look through your receipts and then kind of track how many bags of waste. And if you don't do it by bags, how many dumpsters, how many um, cans you're creating of, of trash recycling and any compost or donation that you're doing currently. And then you're going to set some goals about how much you think you can reach with that. Okay, this is my favorite part, the menu makeover. So a lot of times you go into a place like, mm, let's say some large national brands that have a menu that has 13, 20 pages, and you look at their menu and you're like, wow, that is a ton of food. They must have so much food waste. Now, the best way to reduce food waste is to keep your menu really simple and to also try and use all the different parts of the food. So if you have carrots, for example, that you're getting that have both uh, the roots and the, the tops, you can actually use the tops for certain things. You can use radish greens are really delicious uh, as a menu item if you have radishes in your menu. And you can let the customers participate in the food waste reduction program. And that is by inviting them to uh, get, get on the composting train, separate their food a little bit better, and then take part in asking for the amount of food that they actually want to eat. Because sometimes people don't eat their full plate. They leave half a plate of food. They only really wanted half of it to begin with. And finally, you can work with your suppliers to order smart and order seasonally. So here's our notebook page or workbook page for that. You can take some notes and think about different ways in your business that you can reduce the amount of menu items that you have to reduce the range of ingredients that you have to use and then get creative with some of the, all of the different parts of the food. Before I move on, does anyone here have any thoughts about where they can reduce the amount of food waste that they're using in their current kitchen? You can feel free to drop it in the chat. And the next really important thing here is plate capacity. So even the simple act of reducing the size of your plates means that you're not having to fill the entire plate. Because a study shows that our eyes oftentimes measure the quality of a restaurant by seeing that the entire plate is filled with food. Unless, of course, it's one of those crazy expensive ones. <laughs> but we can reduce our plate size at buffets, and that reduces the amount of waste that people uh, fill up their plate with. So especially if you're working at like a school or a hospital or a hotel, just having a smaller plate will reduce the amount of food waste that you're seeing. 92% of restaurants serve way too much food. And that's because customers want to make sure that their dollar goes towards finding more food on their plate. It doesn't necessarily mean that the quality of food, the cost of the overhead is considered that. It's just customers want to see their, their food or their plate filled with food. So here's our plate waste workbook page. Um, you can offer a doggy bag before taking away a plate. That goes for the front of house 
staff to ask if people want to take it home and maybe finish their meal later, even if it's just a few bites. Um, you can choose compostable paper or um, for plastics, if you have to, with soups and things, use a sturdy number one recyclable plastic. Most municipalities have a number one recycling um, program in place. And of course, allergies. I myself have food allergies and I hate wasting food if somebody messes up an order. Um, I'm always usually pretty diligent about asking for allergies, uh, aller things that I'm allergic to in the food, but um, I've been to several restaurants where they ask people ahead of time, do you have any allergies? And that's a really great thing if somebody forgot to say, and it will reduce the amount of food that will be sent back to the kitchen and wasted. Okay, now let's talk about leftovers. So I have seen some really creative ways in some restaurants that people have taken food from the previous day and turned it into a new meal. Chefs and staff can find the, the, the a delight in coming up with different menu items that you can use from leftover foods. And then there's some apps like Buffet Go and Too Good To Go where you can give discounted sales either at the end of the day or the following day for food that is, you know, still edible, but a little bit past its prime. And here you can write down some ideas about how you can reuse leftovers in your kitchen. Again, drop it in the chat if you have any ideas about things you might be able to do with leftover foods at your commercial kitchen. Um, you can also have leftover foods that make a family meal for your staff. You can have a soup of the day or add specials. Like for example, if you had um, leftover steak or leftover bacon, right? You can use that to add flavoring to mac and cheese or make a casserole, a uh, breakfast burrito and foods that could be cooked to order um, instead of bulk prepping, especially towards the end of day reduces the amount of food waste that you'll have as well. So here's some other quick tips that I love utilizing at my home is that you can re-crisp re stocky vegetables like celery. I once had a bouquet of cilantro that lasted in my fridge in a, in a little cup of water for about two weeks. Usually cilantro lasts a day before it dies on me. Um, you can flash freeze fruits and vegetables that are about to expire and use those for stock, um, chicken stock, chicken soup, or you can also use them for smoothies. Um, you can marinate meats, that makes them last a little bit longer in the fridge. And another really big one is switching to reusable plates and cutlery. So just for reducing waste in general, this is not reducing food waste, but reusables are definitely much better for the planet, will save you a ton on your trash bills. And there are some programs out there that can help you if your restaurant is currently using uh, disposables. So there, I don't know if, raise your hand if you've heard about FIFO, FIFO, food storage left to right, first in, first out, um, stocking things in your refrigerator so that you're making sure to bring old things forward before you put new things in on top of it. You put new things in the back of the fridge or in the pantry and then storing things from left to right on any, any sort of shelving so that you know where to take uh, a new thing of food from so you're not leaving the same bag of, of flour again and again. Here is a really great resource for y'all. It's called Rethink Disposable. They help restaurants convert from disposables into reusables and they have $500 available for restaurants to do so. I'll have uh, their information also in the workbook at the resources page. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about donation. So I mentioned before that you can write off uh, up to $5,000 in a tax deduction just from donating food. The criteria for that is that the recipient of the food needs to be a 501c3 nonprofit organization. As taxes go, Uncle Sam wants us to be donating to 501c3. And the donee must give the donated food solely to the ill, the needy, or infants. And the donee may not use or transfer the food in exchange for money or other property or services. That's not to say that you can't donate food to nonprofits that do resell it. You still can. It's just for the tax deduction criteria of that. And then the donee must provide a written statement to the donor stating that all requirements have been met. 
and the donated food must be in compliance with the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and California Health and Safety Code for the state of California. And again, no one has ever been sued for donating food. Permitted food facilities can donate prepared food and meals to nonprofit charitable organizations or now individuals directly because of the uh, this year's Food Donation Improvement Act. Food that has been previously served to consumer cannot be donated. So if you have a buffet style where it's self-serve, you cannot donate that type of food. But if you do an event where you have food that is uh, served by a trained staff person and put onto the plate of the um, individuals that are being served, you can donate leftovers there. You cannot donate, individuals cannot donate uncooked or prepackaged food products. Um, or sorry, individuals can donate uncooked or prepackaged food products like canned food items um, that can be prepared on site by the approved food handlers. So that's just individuals, but businesses can donate anything. And uh, the, the Good Samaritan Act covers liability for both the donor and the nonprofit as long as there's no gross neg negligence or intentional misconduct. Nonprofits have a lot of food safety experience, and that's a part of what makes them able to accept the foods that they are. If a nonprofit doesn't have someone on staff, they generally only are able to take certain types of food, like prepackaged food, um, the shelf stable items, and sometimes some produce and things. So um, having the network of carrot in your back pocket of knowing uh, that different nonprofits have different needs is gonna be really helpful for you to figure out who to donate food to instead of going on a wild goose chase trying to figure that out. And just general food safety things. I'm sure everyone on this call has a little bit of food safety experience. You have to keep a temperature check for prepared food. You have to rely on your surf, uh, serve safe training you don't have to rely on best buy dates. And this is something that a lot of people don't know is that a best buy does not necessarily mean expired. Best buy dates have absolutely no real uh, protocol for what that date is. It's just the, the manufacturer's way of saying, we think you should buy more food after the specific date, <laughs> but you can still donate it to a lot of nonprofit organizations. It depends on the individual organizations uh, regulations that they follow. It's so mentioning. Oh, sorry, go ahead, sorry. Daniel. the FDA has also published a, a paper and quick little document saying generally how long something is good for after the best by date for undented canned goods. It could be up to a year for <laughs> dairy. Uh, they say, three days is a safe average across North America. If, if you're next to a dairy farm, probably a bit longer, but the FDA has all that stuff on their website and it's decently easy to find. Yes, absolutely. And if you visit the carrot site, we have a blog post of the FDA's new newly posted regulations about a detailed guide for how to safely donate food. It's it's like a hundred pages long. It's a lot. It's a lot of information, but most of it follows the serve safe uh, safety protocol. Okay, so this is too much to read, but this will be in your workbook. You can scan down to figure out the temperature control, transportation, and safety, and then some more information about expiration dates here. Okay, so when you're getting started on a food donation program, does anyone here have a food donation program already in place that they're working with? Given a couple seconds for someone to respond. Very active group today. <laughs> okay, so the, you have to figure out what types of food will be donated based on, let's say you have ingredients. Um, looks like we have someone there we go. Emily is running the program for the county. I love to hear that. And Jessica also is running a program for the region. I love that. So will you be able to donate dairy? Will you have leftover proteins? Will you have leftover prepared food? Or will it be mostly ingredients? 
making a list of the different types of food you'll have to donate will be essential to getting started with this program because it will help you determine not only how you need to store that food safely until it can be donated, how much storage space is needed, what containers are needed to store and transport that food, and what needs to be labeled and how so that all staff are clear that this specific food is for donation and should not be thrown out. And then also, when should the food be donated? Sometimes a restaurant might have a daily food donation program, especially bakeries. They might have twice a day. They have bagels and donuts and all sorts of things that get, get um, donated on a regular basis. And other restaurants, maybe once a week or twice a week, they'll have someone come by, pick up their food, and then record that. So here's your workbook page for um, making notes of the storage needed, the container needed. Maybe you'll have to do some purchasing or figure out a way to do a, a, an exchange program with reusable trays or pots. Um, and then a storage plan, where is there a specific place in your walk-in refrigerator or is there a specific just donation refrigerator only? In the chat, we have Emily from San Mateo. Thank you, Emily. Okay, now that gets us to carrot. Where does carrot fit in? Why am I giving this presentation right now? Carrot was designed after all of my personal experience working with food recovery agencies, working as an event sustainability coordinator and then running a restaurant as well. This is one stop shop for any business and any nonprofit organization that wants to donate food or rescue food. So Carrot is completely free to download, sign up, and add a food donation. And it's completely free for nonprofits also to utilize to rescue food or donate the surplus food that they have. If you're not an app savvy person, we also have the same exact uh, way that you can use Carrot on the app. You can also use on your web browser, on your desktop or a laptop computer. And the steps are simple. You create an account as a nonprofit or as a business. You can add team members. They can create their team member account to sign in as well. And then you create a food donation. You write the details about the donation, indicate what type of food it is, or if it's non-food, you can also make a non-food donation. Sometimes that's anywhere, anything from disposable plates you have left over to I have a refrigerator I wanna donate. You can donate all types of, types of household goods as well as a business or, or a nonprofit. And then you can either request a donation to be picked up from you, or if you have the capability, and we really stress this, if you can deliver, offer to deliver it to local nonprofit organizations, because they are oftentimes run on volunteers and they need a lot of help with coordinating logistics, um, especially to get a smaller donation. And you on Carrot indicate the, um, the date and time available. This gives you a window of time that someone can react, assign somebody. So oftentimes on Carrot, we see that if you post just a two hour window, it's not often enough for a nonprofit to be able to react and get somebody there in time until it expires and no longer shows up on the app. We often suggest at least a day advance notice to let the local nonprofits know that um, the donation is available and find somebody that can respond quickly to be able to go pick it up from you or receive it if you're able to drop it off. All right. so. Currently, Carrot is operating in over 40 states in over 2,700 locations. We've had 27,000 donations come through, and have, that has resulted in over 9 million pounds of food being donated. On everyone's dashboard, we have impact tracking stats um, on both the app and on, their, on the, the laptop or desktop computer, where you can see not only the total pounds of food that you don donated, total number of donations and, and the CO2 saved, but also the different types of food that you've donated broken down by weight. Here's a quick demo of how to use the Carrot app. So to make a donation on Carrot, you simply download the app, log in, click the donate button, Add in the title of your donation. Give a description. Add the type of donation, the approximate size of the donation, whether or not you can deliver or need a pickup. 
when the donation is available and when it will need to be picked up by. And then you add a nonprofit if you have a pre existing relationship with one. And you can add a photo of the donation. Then when you post, a nonprofit nearby will see your donation and be able to reserve that donation and take it back to the people in need and then record the weight of the final donation. Now I should mention really quick that you don't need to assign a nonprofit so organization. Um, if you don't know who you would like to donate it to, we have a, a, a response system that once you post a donation, we're able to send that out automatically to nonprofits in your area who can then um, kind of self-assign to decide if they need it or not. Uh, this is an option of one of our advanced services, which is for um, corporations. So we actually have several kitchens that have chains across the US. They're utilizing Carrot to donate from each location and then have a report auto-generated from all of the different teams that are donating. We can show them all the individual donations and then also tally that up for a specific month uh, based on the donor and the relationship to the recipient. And it shows the total pounds of food that are donated so that they can do tracking for not only their taxes, but their impact as well. Okay, so that is a uh, the brief explanation of how to use carrot to donate food. If you also um, have other food programs in place where you can donate directly to a nonprofit, you can assign it to them on carrot if you get them to download the carrot account. It just gives you a little bit more information um, for tracking on an instant basis when you utilize carrot. And like I said, it's totally free. So it's just a, a kind of added service to any existing donation programs that you have in place. So now we're gonna move on to compost, which is again, one of my favorite things because compost is so good for the planet. It's the rebirth of everything. So what you're gonna need to figure out for compost when you're starting a compost program with your kitchen is A, who your waste haulers are. Those are your garbage companies. Do they have a composting program in place? B, who your community composters are. Oh, they are so often overlooked because they're the people that are utilizing volunteers to actually create some of the highest quality compost that any soil will ever see. Then we can look at dehydrators. A lot of times people think, oh, we have a machine and it turns it into compost in just a couple of hours. That's not true. It's actually turning it into dehydrated food. It's just taking all the liquid out of it. Um, if you re-add liquid to it, it's just a sloppy mess again but sometimes it's still at least a worthwhile uh, benefit for a large kitchen to have a dehydrator because it reduces the actual size of the food that is um, going to be then uh, given to a, a composter to be able to finish off. If you are lucky enough to be in a uh, rural area or have some land, you can do a DIY compost project, and I'll get into that a little bit, but also share some resources at the end to give you more detail about that. And then uh, the last one is Bokashi. And if you haven't heard of Bokashi, it's a way to kind of make a really powerful breakdown process with the different microbes that are able to eat the food and convert it into healthy soil in a really fast fashion. Um, Kashi is often used in smaller quantities. It can be used um, as, a, as a countertop composting method. You sprinkle some of the Bokashi, uh, um, I don't even know what it is actually. <laughs> is, it, is it dehydrated or is it just active ingredients of what actually goes in and breaks down the food? If, if you know, please put it in the chat, but I've seen it work and it's amazing. Okay. so. For creating your compost plan, you'll need to have the right bin in the right place. Oftentimes in a kitchen where a compost plan fails is that you'll have a bin that is designated as a compost bin and nobody's using it as that. They're putting gloves in it, they're putting plastic in it, they're not using it right because it used to be a garbage can and they would just throw everything in there. So you have to have the right bin in the right place. You have to have the space for it. You have to identify in your kitchen, where can I have compost bin that is near a trash bin? And how big does it need to be? 
does it need to be able to be like a, with what we call a slim gym that takes up like the whole from the ground up space or does it can it just be a countertop uh, container that we're able to just throw our extra stuff into so identifying in the kitchen where different types of food that are different sizes take place is going to be your first step and then bags and signs. So it's always best idea, best practice, to either use clear plastic bags or compostable bags. And this makes sure that the staff that does the cleanup at the end of the night does not confuse it with trash and put it into the wrong bin or put it into the wrong location. Um, with a clear bag or a compostable bag, you can kind of see straight away that that's all food in there. It's not any plastic. It's not anything that we, we need to throw away. And you can also identify if there are contaminants in the compost, in the compost as well with a, with a clear bag. And then finally, and this is the hardest part, is staff collaboration. You have to identify the cleanup schedules, where are bags taken to, who takes them, what are their routes of getting through, what kind of uh, capabilities do they need to have to take a, a really full heavy bag of food to a specific location. When trash is mixed with both um, food scraps and non-food scraps, it's a little bit lighter and easier to carry. But if you have a really big compost bag, that can be actually really heavy. And if you have to get up any stairs or go around any tight corners, that can be a little bit hard. So you can create a procedure and have meetings to talk about this with your staff um, and with your cleaning staff to make sure that you have the right program in place. And here's our example of areas where you might be able to divert food scraps from going to the landfill, like in prep stations, or if you have a bar, the fruit that's um, the fruit that is garnishing your drinks sometimes uh, will just ultimately get composted. People don't eat it, or near the dishwashing station. Uh, make a list of your trash companies with compost services nearby. You might need to switch over to a different waste hauler. If you are especially the decision maker, you can make that decision. Or community composters. When you do get a hold of your waste hauler that does compost, you need to ask specifically what are the items that they accept. Sometimes they don't accept bamboo. Sometimes they don't accept meat. Sometimes they don't accept dairy. Um, you'll need to make a detailed list of what they do and don't accept as a waste hauling company because they have different uh, ways to screen out that food to make sure that it's going to turn into the ultimate product that they need. And you'll also want to look at the placement. You're going to need to make signs that are in the different languages that you'll need for your staff that work at the kitchen. And then make notes of the cleaning schedule and the disposal plan. Okay, this is a question that comes up a lot for me when I talk about compost is what about bioplastics? So we have a lot of different types of companies that are coming up creating food that they're calling either compostable or biodegradable. There's not a perfect system right now to have a stamp of approval that says this is this is definitely compostable because it really depends on your own system. So if that, whether that be the community composters or a, a municipal um, composting facility, you're going to again need to ask what types of bioplastics they do or don't take. So before you convert your entire kitchen over into um, compostable where, <laughs> again, reusable is always better than, than disposable, but you're going to need to make sure that that product that you're buying is actually going to break down in the system that you're trying to compost. Well, if you can't compost at all, it always is still better for the environment to have a compostable product. You're still wanna, gonna wanna do your research to make sure that product's actually compostable. Many companies that call their product compostable or biodegradable actually use a plasticine chemical uh, to turn whatever it is that they're making their product out of potatoes or cornstarch into something that is solid and can withstand the temperature and, and hardiness of, of a plate of food. So you're gonna wanna check with them to make sure um, and do your research to make sure that uh, the product that you're buying is actually going to break down and is not just going to be another plastic expense for your company. All right, tips and tricks for the kitchen. If you are not recycling your biofuel, you are sitting on a gold mine, or grease, excuse me, that's, that's biofuel that can be um, converted into basically a fuel alternative um, grease is often picked up for free or sometimes companies can get paid for 
the grease that they keep in their grease trap in their kitchen. Um, another thing that you should consider is paper towels when you're wiping down your containers. So paper towels might be, um, might be compostable depending on where you're actually getting your, uh, your items composted, but sometimes they'll wanna do an unbleached paper towel. Or oftentimes you can use that laundry service where you have reusable washcloths instead of paper towels for wiping down all different sorts of things. I mentioned before you can do animal feed if you have a relationship with a farm that you're buying food directly from if you're buying pork from a farmer ask the farmer if they are actually looking for food scraps for their pigs and again work with them to figure out what what they will and won't accept and in and, and what method that you could do a little exchange and you might be able to make a relationship where you get a discount if you have any of these programs set in place or you're starting to share your story with your customers because many surveys have shown that customers actually care about whether or not the establishment that they're frequenting is doing a food waste reduction program. And oftentimes they're even willing to add a little bit onto their receipt. If you are doing a food donation program or a composting program that requires more labor, labor from your staff um, to have a little bit of a, a fee tacked on there just for, for food donation. And most people are okay with that. Um, and definitely measure before and after so that you can actually see the metrics of what you're able to accomplish in running a program like this. And the last thing, but most important thing is create staff buy-in with regular meetings, setting goals and celebrating any goals that you achieve. Because it's the staff that are really gonna keep this going and it's the staff that can help it uh, fall apart if it's not regularly celebrated and, and watched. Here's a list of resources. I'll just go through a little bit here in your workbook, um, you'll be able to access these different links. Tim Hortons, eh, out of Canada, has a really great restaurant sustainability guide. Uh, city Compost Resources from Rethink Green has um, a list of cities that compost for you. And the Composting Council has a list of state composting policies. There's a guide for community composting um, listed here and a tax guide for food donation uh, information about writing and offering your taxes. There was a food keeper app in there that the, um, I can't remember if it's the FD, I, somebody created, I'm sorry, I can't remember right now, but there's, there's an app that helps you track the food that you have in your fridge and uh, how quickly it's probably going to go bad so that you can make your meal planning and scheduling according to that. If you want to get involved with a really cool uh, employee buy-in program, you can sign up for the EPA Food Recovery Challenge, and that will really get people on your team interested in promoting the food recovery efforts that you're doing. Um, safe food storage link, a fresh food storage tip, and then of course the last on here is the DIY compost bins. If you are able to start a composting program on site, um, or nearby, uh, this DIY composting bin is a, is a really great educational tool for you to get started on that. And then of course, don't forget to download the Carrot app or create a free account on the Carrot website so that when you have food donations or if you're a nonprofit on this call, when you want food donations, you'll be able to see them as they come up in your area. Daniel here is our account executive who, as we see people sign up in different areas, like I said, we're in over 40 states now, he's able to identify who we need to start doing outreach to based on whether or not it's a, a donor or a nonprofit agency that has signed up so that we can start making more connections in each community that we're involved in. Okay. My contact information is allison at carrot.com if you have any further questions. You can also reach us by visiting carrot.com and there's a lot more information about Carrot on there. Okay, anybody from the audience, would you have any questions? Would anybody like to share anything? Um, somebody says, are there any subscription charges for users of Carrot? There are additional uh, levels up that you can do. There's a food mover application that larger food, um, food logistics, nonprofits or food banks use to monitor all of their volunteers, all of their drivers, and then create a scheduling system, send out information to their different um, 
users and that platform subscription charges $250 per month. Usually we find partners that are able to cover the cost for smaller nonprofits that don't have access to those funds. There are um, subscription charges for corporations that would like to charge or that would like to track more than one of their locations. And we also have a subscription for um, municipal users that would like to uh, launch a, a full area or municipal or countywide program to be able to track all of the donations that are happening within their geographic area. And then there's some additional features on top of that that are utilized to be able to, to create an implementation program. Hope that answered your question, Emily. If you'd like to schedule um, a demo of all the different carrot types and features, you can either schedule with myself at calendly.com slash carrot or with Daniel here, who has a lot more time than I do, if you want to put your link in the chat there. Absolutely. And I would love, if you want to unmute yourself, introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your program, I would love to hear more from everybody here. Uh, I guess I'll unmute myself. I've been asking questions in the chat. So hi, I'm Emily. I work for the County of San Mateo in the Environmental Health Services Department. And we help businesses um, stay in compliance with SB 1383. I work with both schools and um, businesses organizations under what we call the Safe Surplus Donation Food Donation Program. And it hasn't really been active um, because SB 1383 wasn't being, um, I guess, like monitored or really like, uh, I guess, enforced by the government in California, at least until uh, January of this year. So now a lot of businesses are like, oh my gosh, uh, let me try and get something in place to reduce my food weight, edible food waste and my, you know, restructure my waste stream. So um, we're like updating the program. And so this sounds like something that um, for our municipality needs might be awesome. Um, I don't know if we have enough users who participate yet, but I, I, I don't know if it's because we don't have something like this for them to use that's easy and convenient. And that's why the program's not really taking off um, or um, if it's like, there's just not enough awareness, but I think it's just, it's new. There's not a lot of awareness, but if we made it really easy with something like Carrot, that would be awesome. So I'm gonna definitely book an appointment with Daniel or you or whoever, doesn't, doesn't really matter uh, to get more information. But yeah, this seems really awesome. We live like, so we're in the heart of um, Silicon Valley. And so, you know, there's a lot of technology savvy people who like the convenience of apps and, um, automated donation systems and stuff. So this is really, really awesome. I'm so glad there's something like this and I'll definitely be looking more into it. So thank you so much for your presentation and, and for doing this, it's so great. Yeah, definitely. We're working with the County of Alameda. We're working with um, Monterey County. Um, I know that uh, Silicon Valley kind of has their own program in place right now too, but we're happy to meet with County of San Mateo and um, talk with you more about how to do that. I'm the resident expert on SB 1383, so you'd probably wanna book a, a meeting directly with me, but yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, and then I see Tracy Austin in Florida has a question. <clears throat> Can one search care for participants who accept donations in my area? Uh, yes, if you make a business account or a nonprofit account and go to post a donation, you'll have a drop down list of uh, participants, a nonprofit participants who um, will accept donations uh, when you go to assign a donation um, to a specific nonprofit. Uh, if you wanted to connect with me uh, offline, Tracy, I would be able to talk more about users in Florida as well. And from Kim, we have do most food donation opportunities that get posted on Carrot get picked up? Yes. And if they're not picked up, what should the restaurant do? So in the, like I mentioned a little bit before, if you only give a small narrow window of the, the pickup opportunity on carrot for the start time and the end time, then you probably won't get your donation picked up because it takes nonprofits a little bit of time. They're very busy feeding a lot of clients usually. So if you post a donation, try to post it a day in advance. 
And if it doesn't get picked up right away, if you're able to freeze that donation, if it's prepared food, do so. And then just elongate the donation a little bit. That'll give us more time. If we don't maybe have enough of the nonprofits in the area already signed up, we'll, we'll see your donation, we'll flag it, and we'll start doing more outreach ourselves to be able to find a, a suitable nonprofit that will be able to take it. And um, if eventually nobody wants your donation, maybe it's a jar of pickles, you know, <laughs> nobody wants a jar of pickles, uh, then ultimately you can um, give it to one of your staff, find a way to compost it, uh, or um, find a way to reuse it into another uh, meal, if at all possible, you know, what, do the food waste prevention route too. But um, most food is wanted. I have literally seen uh, jars of soy sauce get donated on carrot and the nonprofit has been ever so grateful to be able to receive it uh, as long as you give enough time for them to respond to that. Okay, does anyone else have any questions or want to share their story about food recovery, about composting, or about food uh, waste prevention? Hi, Daniela. Hola, Alison, you have a lovely presentation. I'm sorry I was here a little late, so I look forward to listen to the whole recording. The app of Carrot Sink is amazing. I'll study it some more. I'm based in the agricultural reserve that is outside of Washington, D.C. in Montgomery County. And recently in Maryland, there was a regulation change that is going to require anybody in proximity 30 miles to, you know, like a compost facility to divert their waste. As we all know, ideally, it should go up in the ladder. So that's why I'm so excited about this summit this week. Um, I'm a freelance. I do translations and outreach for those that are already doing amazing work like you and to so help them, you know, get their stuff in the languages that they need to. I mainly do Spanish, sometimes Portuguese and French because I'm originally a translator. But um, I just feel like different cultures have different patterns, you know, and things that were very, like, prevention food waste in the past don't necessarily always pass through the new generations in this country. So we can all like relearn and um, and your technology seems great for that. So thank you for your presentation today. Thank you, that's awesome. Yeah, we, we have been translating carrot uh, flyers into Spanish, but eventually we're gonna have to do the whole app and French because we're moving into Canada very quickly and Quebec uh, we'll, we'll want that in French. We also have a lot of people in um, Central and, and the Central America and the, and the Caribbean that want to start using carrot too. So we'll, we'll be needing to, to do that. <clears throat> thank you, Kim. Thank you, uh, Daniela. Thank you, Emily, for sharing. Thank you, Tracy, for your questions. If there's anybody else that has any questions or would like to share, please do so. We'd love to hear from you. Hi, Jessica. Hi. Hi, this is Jessica Weiss. Um, I thank you. For, I'm, I just wanted to tell everybody that th this is such a pleasurable group to be working with. Um, in addition to being extremely comprehensive and affordable. Um, I've been, I've been working with other apps over the past decade and, um, I'm just really excited about working with Carrot because I think they also share, you know, our mission, which is it is zero waste. So, um, and I, I wanted to also just double check that as far as the, like if I'm doing this for the whole region of the Catskills, like more than one county, is that when the uh, charge comes in or is that only if we, if you are doing the data input and the matching? Um, if you're using the, the food mover account, um, there is the, the $250 a month charge for that. And that mainly is to cover our costs for the amount of data and staff time that is needed to implement that. Um, but like I mentioned, most of the nonprofits that we're working with, we are actually able to find a way to subsidize that cost through a grant or through a, uh, an organization, a, a, a government office or a, um, a corporation that is able to pay for that charge for the, the nonprofit. So you and I, I think, connected uh, a little bit before, and we can reconnect again about that. So um, we can get you started and uh, and work out the details there. Great. I'm 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 just I'm really excited. I just the more <laughs> the more I've been working with the other app, the more I become more and more excited about working with Carrot. So um, 
anyway, I just wanted to put in a good plug for you and happy uh, upcoming birthday. Oh, yes, that's when I'm getting married. <laughs> ah, mazel tov. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Yep. Okay. Well, if nobody else wants to share, I'm just going to go ahead and um, stop the video and uh, I will be sending everybody a follow up with the information again about the workbook and uh, information about how to contact Daniel and I to set up a demo. Um, if you'd like to reach out to us directly, please do so. And please, please, please share all of the information that you learned today with as many people as you can, especially in regards to um, how we really need to start worrying about food waste prevention across the entire food chain. So thank you everybody for all that you do. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll hopefully see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for coming.